Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome again for this exclusive webinar series on signature experiences of Australia. I hope you all are doing very well and getting all prepped up for your coming weekend. And um, well, today we bring you two of the most interesting collectives that everybody has been waiting for. Uh, so we bring you the ultimate uh, winery experiences of Australia and the great golf uh, experiences of Australia as well. Uh, I personally have um, an inclination towards the winery uh, experience or a winery collective that we have here. It's been one of the most fascinating ones and um, I'm, I'm definitely not the expert here. So I'd like to call about uh, call upon the lady who knows it all. Kate, welcome. Welcome to the session. And Kate Schilling is the executive officer of the Ultimate Winery Experiences of Australia. And over to you, Kate. Our audience, I'm sure, is very keen to learn about this. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Thank you so much there, Ritu. That's really, been, it's really great to meet you all virtually. And I guess uh, for Biz and I, it's really great to meet you on a Friday afternoon where the weekend is nearly upon us. And yes. I know in my world, um, at 3.30, it's a bit early to be drinking a glass of wine, but it won't be long until I have one in my hot little hand. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to speak to you today about the Ultimate Winery Experiences. Um, we've been really busy through the shutdown and we have lots of news to tell you. So let me okay. see. So let's hold on and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see if this is going to move on. Here we go. Okay, so um, everyone, welcome, as I said, to an update on the Ultimate Winery Experiences Australia. We are a group of 25 wineries from 15 major wine regions across the country. And we're we were one of the earlier members of Tourism Australia's signature, signature Experience Collectives. We were invented just over seven years ago when Tourism Australia realised through their research that, that uh, the food and wine experience was part of the decision making process when it came to people deciding where they would go on holidays, whether it was Italy or Argentina or Australia. People wanted to learn a little bit more about what food and what, what they could eat, what they could drink and what was going on in that scene in each country. So Tourism Australia did an amazing job about inspiring people about our great food and wine. And it got to the point where uh, people were inspired. They were saying, well, where can I go and what can I do? What can I book? What's the best for me? So we brought, at that stage, nine wineries together because those wineries understood that if they were able to offer a deeper experience on site in the vines, an opportunity to go beyond the cellar door, that people would be, um, A, learn a lot more about the, um, the, the wineries and the wine they were drinking, but have it just learn, be, be part of the, um, the local community and have that, learn a little bit more about that destination. So that's when we came together. We find ourselves now, uh, seven and a half years later, with 25 wineries. But the thing that brings us all together, I guess, from the starting point is each winery offers experiences that are not the same. We hand pick our wineries um, based on a few, uh, few criteria. One is the diversity and the innovative approach that they exhibit because we are global leaders when it comes to wine tourism. And we, we're looking to work with wineries who are keen to share the experience to enjoy the Australian way with wine. Now that means that um, we, the customers that are typical and the ones that book with us are what we call experience seekers. They're people that love great food and wine, but they love it even more if the wine's being poured by the winemaker who produced that wine, if they're eating food that has grown in the kitchen garden that is right next to the winery. And one thing that we've noticed um, even before the world unraveled with COVID was that our winery is a real anchor attractions within their community. They work very collaboratively with other food producers and with the other wineries around them. So we attract customers who are really keen to, to uh, learn that little bit more about the food and wine that they're drinking in each region. Some of the other criteria around that is that ability to explore beyond the cellar door. So our wineries are really excited to be able to open up uh, parts of, parts of the, the vines and the, the winery that aren't normally accessible to everyone else. 
So a lot of people can come and pay to do just a basic tasting and that's really lovely. But our experience is that other, as I mentioned, that little bit deeper, that little bit more immersive. And so really the wineries are doing that because they know that if they tell stories that set the scene with their winery, um, people will linger that bit longer. They'll learn more from the locals and they will be more, when they're back home in a restaurant or maybe in a wine shop, they'll see a bottle of Australian wine and they'll be transported immediately back to their holiday and what they learned while they were there. Uh, one thing that I wanted to set uh, from the, let you know from the get-go is that premium wines are a given when it comes to our ultimate winery experiences. As I said, they've been chosen, our wineries have been chosen for their innovation and their rich diversity. And a lot of them are world famous when it comes to comparing the winemaking uh, practices uh, with us versus those in Europe and those in North America. So just to fill you in on where our wineries are, as you can see, we've got the country covered. Um, our heartland he is here in South Australia. We have eight wineries in regions that you will have heard of, like the Barossa Valley and the Clarendon Vale and the Adelaide Hills. But we also have a lot of wineries in Victoria. We have seven wineries there right now, covering regions like the Mornington Peninsula, the Yarra Valley, the King Valley and the Alpine Valleys. And of course, we have a couple of wineries down in Tasmania. We have wineries down in Margaret River in Western Australia, as well as a winery on the Swan uh, River just near Perth. We even have a winery up there here in Queensland uh, called Sirame. And it's worth noting at this stage that our wineries that are close to um, both Perth and uh, and Brisbane, that's a really lovely way to start or end a trip because both those wineries have accommodation on site. So rather than putting your customers into a city hotel, there are wineries that are only 15, 20 minutes from the airport with lovely accommodation in the vines. And that's a really great way to start or end your trip to Australia. And of course, for those that are looking at New South Wales, uh, one of our oldest, most famous wine regions there is the Hunter Valley. And we have three wineries in that region. Now, as I mentioned, all these wineries have been chosen for their diversity. So when you, uh, to use the Hunter Valley as an example, when your customers are in the Hunter Valley, they will, could go to Audrey Wilkinson to experience their, they've probably got the best view in the whole of the Hunter Valley and they have a premium picnic experience that you could do there. Brokenwood has invested a, um, a lot in their cellar door and they are right at the winery. So you get to see the working winery when you're there. And then Tyrrell's is one of the oldest winemaking families in our country. I believe it's of the 14 oldest sites, vineyards in Australia, Tyrrell's owns 11 of them and they're all over 100 years old. So it just gives you an idea on whether it's heritage, the outdoors, or learning a little bit more about the great food and wine in a working winery, we have those experiences to offer. So as I mentioned, we have 25 wineries from 15 wine regions. And collectively, we're offering 120 classic bookable experiences that are available for you and your customers to book. To talk a little bit more about those, I'm hoping this is moving on. I wanted to just let you know that um, our wineries, as we mentioned, have been hand selected, but they've been hand selected because all these experiences have been developed because they're customer focused but they're easily connected. So no matter which partner you work with, which DMC, which uh, wholesaler or inbounder, our wineries will have a contract with them and they're very easily connected into your system. And of course, they've been developed um, and priced properly. So all the experiences are commissionable as well. Uh, so when we talk about our experiences, we have three different categories. We've got our classics, we've got our wine trails and weekenders where we connect the dots and help you put together some itineraries that you might not otherwise um, that your customers might not otherwise be able to put together themselves. And then we have our reserve range and we've seen some success with this with the Indian market where we're able to customise the classic experiences to create something even more special. And I guess when we talk about the experience seekers loving their food and wine, there are some crazy wine people in every market and I'm sure there are some in India. So if you do have customers that know that little bit more about wine, we can, we can dial up the crazy to meet their requests no matter what they are. And we call that the reserve range. So to run through the different pillars under which we categorize our winery experiences, they come under four different pillars. 
of course, great food, a great wine is enhanced by great food. So we have a massive pillar around food and wine matching called taste. We also do a lot of DIY, fun, hands-on educational experiences as well. We're able to um, connect the dots, as I said, and our wineries are very collaborative within their region with other wineries, with other uh, food and wine producers, but also with other touring experiences. So that ability to truly discover a region, um, we, we have a lot of really interesting experiences that have that deeper immersion. And then for those, uh, for those customers who are in Australia because they're celebrating something special, it might be an engagement, it might be a job promotion, it might be a milestone birthday, um, we know how to celebrate in our wineries we can put together some really amazing events and we can really um, show you how to live the high life. So to dive into some of the food and wine matching experiences, and I'm mindful of time, but we might have some time to go into some of these. When it comes to food and wine matching, we really have uh, all different levels covered. So it could be anything from the perfect matching here with, um, proper experiences often linked into uh, an experience in the restaurant or in a private tasting room. And we've got some different experiences there. We do amazing picnics. So that ability to get back to grassroots. And for those of you who have customers in big cities, um, I know that here with the Australian market, this really resonates that chance to take a break from that fast paced urban life uh, recline back in the vines with a with a gourmet picnic hamper and a bottle of fine Australian wine is a really unique experience. Um, that photo there is at Audrey Wilkinson in the Hunter Valley and it really is spectacular. And again, I guess for those of you who were th thinking about the value, um, this experience here sells, it's, it's priced at 75 Australian dollars per person. So whether you've got customers who just, if people have got to eat and drink when they come to Australia, even if they're not thinking they want to specifically go to a winery, this opportunity to experience regional Australia through our winery experiences is pretty unique. We also have experiences, if this slide will move on, and it's taking its time so we can keep talking for a minute. Alyssa. I bet it's going to move on in a minute. We also have experiences that um, in restaurants that are really well recognised in Australia. A lot of, we call it the um, a hatted system. So if you're looking to send your customers to a restaurant that they know or they've heard of or that someone in a city near them recommends, uh, most of our wineries have well recognised restaurants and they'll be able to offer fine dining experiences as well. My slides, guys, are not moving on. Um, for those that are behind this, ah, here we go. Look at that restaurant. Now that's in the Barossa Valley, that's St Hugo. Um, it's right next door to Jacob's Creek. They're owned by the same family and the chef's table there is really famous. Um, we have an estate uh, to plate experience at on the Mornington Peninsula, as well as uh, the estate tour and discovery menu at Voyager Estate in Margaret River as well. And all these experiences are at restaurants where the chefs are pretty famous here in Australia. They've all been on the cooking shows that I know are everywhere like MasterChef and the rest. So we have opportunities there. Now to move on, our next pillar is of course that opportunity to get involved. It's an educational experience where you get to create um, your own, uh, there's lots of masterclasses, there's lots of blending classes and so on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about those um, because our wineries really like to share the love and if our picnics are iconic when it comes to the taste pillar, when it comes to the create and educational pillar, that blending your own version of your own vintage is really great fun. Um, that image is from Darrenberg at the Cube in uh, McLaren Vale in South Australia. And all that glamorous white, uh, the white ice that comes together, you're making your own Shiraz there with really great products to start with. We also do a fabulous blending experience in the Tamar Valley at Joseph Cromie in Tasmania called The Art of Sparkling, uh, where you get to make your own sparkling wine. And many of our other wineries are offering that, offering that blending experiences as well. They're all really small groups, um, often private, just you and the party that you've booked. So it's a really fun way to learn more about wine. 
and you get to take it home back to your hotel. As I mentioned, we have some great restaurants and well-recognised food and wine producers that are local. So cooking classes and culinary experiences are often a big part of the winery experience as well. Uh, this one's at Jacobs Creek, which many people in India know of this brand, but we also offer them at Pizzini in the King Valley and our, in our other wine regions as well. And of course, when it comes to creativity, a lot of our wineries are linked in with the arts. So if you have customers that are really interested in learning more about the Australian art scene, whether it's music concerts, art uh, painting collections or sculptures, a lot of our wineries are connected with those. The most famous of, for us in our portfolio is Mona in Hobart. Um, they own Marilla, which is one of our wineries, and they link in a lot of the, the art experiences with the winery experience there. But we also have some pretty famous sculpture parks um, and programs that support where you're doing your tasting in some really gobsmacking Australian art uh, collections. As I mentioned, we know how to celebrate and we live the high life. This picture is at Feathertop, which is up in the Alpine Valleys in Northeast Victoria. I've been in this bath and I've looked out at those vines. Um, it is a, just a gorgeous area. And I guess if you're looking again to take some time out and to really celebrate, we can help you with that. I've never talked helicopters as much as I have in this role. Um, I know you can fit five helicopters on the helipad at Audrey Wilkinson because we book that sort of thing quite a lot. But we have lots of different accommodation options. So if your customers are looking to stay on at the winery after sunset, um, you can stay in places, as I mentioned, like the Colony at Mandoon Estate in the Swan Valley in Western Australia. There are some glamping tents up at Surame um, at Mount Cotton in Queensland. And six of our other wineries have cottages on site. One of which is pretty famous. It's the, at Jacobs Creek, you can stay in the cottage that the Jacobs family actually lived in 150 years ago. It's beautifully appointed, very well catered for, it's pretty special. So there's lots of different places that you can stay when you come to our wineries as well. As I mentioned, there's a great sense of arrival. Um, this way, getting out from Adelaide out to the Barossa Valley. If you drive, it's pretty close. It's only an hour and a half to two hours, but that helicopter trip makes for a really special sense of arrival. And that's a lot faster, obviously. Now we're not moving on. And as I mentioned, if you've got customers who are looking, whether they're traveling with their family, their extended family, or the group of, if it's a corporate booking, something like that, we again can um, put together some pretty spectacular events that again connect that food and wine experience. And of course, when it comes to discovering the region, we're really good at connecting with the other operators in region, whether it's cyclists, um, whether it's wildlife operators. And as I mentioned, all our wineries by nature of our business, they are in the country. Um, you will uh, see a lot of wildlife in the wild and it, often in the vines. Um, the classic experience, I think, for me is at Sirame in Queensland. They're on 560 acres, only 20 minutes from the Brisbane airport, but there are wallabies everywhere. And even whenever I catch a taxi or an Uber there, when I'm visiting, the taxi driver goes crazy because we don't see this stuff as Australians all the time. So it's really special for everyone, including the locals. And of course, we've got the extraordinary places. You can see there the Darrenberg Cube. That's a tasting room with a difference. You can wine taste right now on every level of that amazing building. When you're on the top floor, you can actually see the ocean and get a real feel for the destination there. So we're really lucky that our, our wineries have put, invested a lot in the locations and the wildlife, making the most of the experiences that are there. So we want you to really enjoy yourself when you're there. So I'm just going to wrap up now by giving you a few easy ways to connect with us because we want to stay in touch. Um, we are on the Aussie Specialist platform. We have our own module, um, which we call it the Masterclass in Wine Tourism. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing more Indian agents complete that class. Uh, but if you wanted to find out more and get more inspiration, there is our website and of course our social media channels as well, which we're updating all the time. But from a trade perspective, we have a special trade site where you can get registered um, with our product manager. She is also called Kate, but she'll be able to register you there. So you can look, look at the nitty gritty details, um, rate information, images, really um, all the nitty gritty product information that you might need. 
And of course, we've then got our, um, we've got collateral that you can access and send out. If you're sending out documents and so on, you can send them out to your customers. Um, and I just wanted to finish off by saying, we've all had a pretty interesting start to 2020. One thing that's been really fun to see is our wineries are starting to do a lot of virtual experiences. So if you've got clients who may have family connections in Australia, um, we'd encourage them to you them all to maybe try and experience at home before they arrive. It's a really lovely way if you're introducing your customers to do that, um, to just give them an idea. And I've done the Pizzini cooking class. I made my own gnocchi, which I never thought I would do, as well as um, as well as the made my own sparkling wine. And I just wanted to finish off by, um, I guess, pointing out this, I think in this, as I mentioned before, going regional is really resonating with customers from all over the world. Getting out of the city is something that's become really important. And I wanted to just finish off by saying our wine regions are much closer than people realise to the main gateways. And their winery experiences are really easy for you as agents to organise. Um, you've, as I mentioned, people have got to eat, they've got to drink, they might as well do it in a wonderful winery and really get that um, feeling about the innovation and the diversity that sits behind the Australian wine scene. So I just wanted to finish off there, if it moves on, by um, saying my details are coming up on a slide at some stage. Alyssa, it might be chance to cut that off. It's not moving on. There we go. So there's my contact details. Um, we are here as that single point of contact for anything you want to know about wine tourism here in Australia. I know for many people um, might not know that much about wine, but we, we're here to help you if, you if you'd like to learn more. And I might hand over and see if we've got any questions with five minutes to go. Thank you, Kate, that was fantastic. And you know, I have I've been fortunate to have quite a few experiences at, uh, at some of these uh, ultimate wineries and some others as well. And always what struck me was that there was something unique about each winery, each vineyard and location, and they maximized that to, to the fullest and they created an experience uh, and they own that experience completely themselves. So whether it was Darenberg or it was Vera Vera or it was Joseph Cromie, or, or even one of the first ones that I went to, which had a which uh, had a small little Harrigan's Irish pub attached to it, which is where I stayed <laughs> overnight in the Hunt Valley. And there was a, that evening there was a big uh, wedding coming in. It was all crazy, crazy celebrations going on. Yeah. So I mean, I guess you've got to see the experience as a whole rather than just going for you know a sip or a try or a taste of Absolutely. of wine. And yeah. I, I think I, I'm really grateful that I've got these opportunities because that led me to shift my perception of uh, uh, the, 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 the perception of the differences between reds and whites. And I was predominantly a white wine drinker. You know, when normally people start, they always start with a sweeter, lighter wine. And I've moved completely now to red. And I just love the bold, big red that come out of Australia from, from, the, from the Barossa yeah. and some other parts as well. So thank you so much for sharing that uh, insightful presentation. It's great. It sounds like we have an, an expert here with the Tourism Australia team in India. So <laughs> I'm just fortunate I've had so many experiences in my journey <laughs> going, going to Australia that I, I, I love talking about it because all of them have been, have been fantastic. So we yes. do have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, yes, Lovelyn, uh, thank you for that. I, I've, been, I've also been to Sepples Field and drinking the Drinking the port from your year of yeah. birth is, uh, is an absolutely amazing experience. How because... fantastic is that experience? It's, um, I believe it's globally, with Sepultsfield is the only one in the world, they have 120 vintages from the last 120 years. So it's always really fun to be able to go and taste the port that was made in the year you were born. But it's also really fun to see how old everyone else is because that's when it all comes out in the wash you would get to think oh my goodness they're born in that year i now i know how old they are so um <laughs> it's um and i know whenever i go there they've um they've just released the vintage from 1920 and so yes i in my case a full disclosure you taste the year 1966 but um every time i take people there they're like oh can i taste the 100 year old port and sepulsfield's more than happy to share that and it's interesting to compare how they taste um, yeah, and I, 
I'm a tourism person, not a wine person. I've been in this job for two years, but I feel like even just every day you get to practice a little more and your palate gets that bit more refined. It's fascinating. Fantastic, yes. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in. I guess I'll take the first one. Uh, uh, this is one is common. I guess we get this question uh, at every session. Uh, are the wineries able to accommodate dietary requirements, uh, allergies, vegetarian, and how much if they do, uh, how much uh, advance notice would they require, especially if it's a large group, um, a large family? To be honest, our average lead in time is really close to the date. Like people are often booking after they've arrived and booking when they get here, even if it might be through their agent back at home. So only a couple of days. People, we, everyone has different dietary requirements and our wineries are very used to accommodating those. So I guess if it was a huge group, um, you know, you'd be looking at seven days notice, but really as long as it's probably 48 hours, I think that would be fine. Um, and in all likelihood, they'd be able to accommodate it even on the day. So it would be fine. Fantastic. And uh, there's also a perception that, you know, if you're not, if you're not a wine consumer or a wine drinker, going to a vineyard is, is not for you. And uh, I, I guess the question here is uh, because we are always trying to help our partners to sell uh, experiences which are so intrinsic to Australia and the brand of Australia. And wine is so, so, so it connects so well with the Australian personality. So how do, how do we help our partners uh, sell winery experiences if their customers uh, are not uh, consumers of wine or don't know a lot about wine because there might be a little bit of, you know, yeah. uh, mis, uh, disconnect yeah. there. Apprehension, I think, sometimes yeah. is the word. I, I felt like that when I first got that job. And I do think that I, it really highlights, I guess, the friendliness of Australia. Tourism Australia's mission is to invite the world to experience the Australian way of life. We just take it a bit further to experience the Australian way with wine. But all the things that sit behind that in terms of the welcome nature of our winemakers, um, they really want to share what they do and what they've learned over the years with as many customers as possible. And they totally understand that we all come with a different perception of what wine tasting is all about. So they're very used to sort of, um, or first up, they're always checking in to say, so who knows a little bit about wine? Who doesn't? They love it when people don't because then they get to share a little bit more. And um, I think it's a really great way of just highlighting, um, I guess, the innovation and the diversity and that they're keen to tell their story and share more. So there's, um, there's no pressure, but they really, they, I think if you were nervous or thinking it would be a really formal experience, it's not. It's pretty friendly and it's pretty casual, very Aussie, very laid back. Okay, fantastic. That's great to know. And I guess the, the flip side to that question is uh, if there are connoisseurs of, of yes. wine, what, what, kind of, what, what, what could they expect from uh, an Australian? Yeah, and we do, we yeah. get really interest, and it's mainly from Aussie specialists who contact us saying, I've got a customer who knows their Cabernets or really is interested in Pinot. And yes, we know they could taste a lot of reds, but they only want to taste this particular variety. Um, yeah. Again, the winemakers, if you've got a crazy wine client, we can dial up the crazy to meet that. And um, we've got really good examples. It often happens, um, say, after the Australian Open tennis and what have you, where the clients will have had those courtside seats to the tennis and they all the cricket and things like that. And they're like, we need to do something really special. So that sometimes requires a little bit of notice where because we will, we can get technical. We can wing, ring Wine Australia and say, okay, this customer, knows, he's got a seller. He knows what he's talking about. Let's get Wine Australia involved as well. So that's what we're here for is to really help you qualify um, your customer, what they want to do, what they, they, often they know what, they know what they don't want to do, but they don't know what they do want to do. So we can help you kind of refine that to give them all the possibilities. Thank you. And I guess the last one is uh, in terms of if I'm, if I'm staying, if, if our clients are staying in a city, how do we then choose, you know, which uh, vineyard to get to and how should we choose to get there? Do you recommend self-drive or do you recommend uh, booking a tour? They, oh, how would yeah, you? Yeah, it's, um, they both work. We get a lot of customers who book, um, who do sort of 
they've worked out with us that they're going to connect and to use McLaren Vale as an example, they might be starting with the heritage of Wira, going on to the biodynamic nature-based experience at Gemtree and then finishing off with a meal at Darrenburg. And they, if, if they are driving, it's a good idea to have a designated driver, um, one who is maybe just shepherding them around but not drinking. Um, if they want, all want to share in that experience, we have a whole slew of tour operators that we recommend you work with, as well as your DMC often is really great at pulling all them together because we, we work really closely with them. So if you're, whether you're working with a premium DMC or one of the online guys, would they will know, um, we share that information a lot in our trade cons. So both ways are good. Um, I like, it's not just me, but I kind of like being driven around. Um, because then you often are getting that tour operator giving you their, their locals as well. So they're often taking you to secret places, maybe to take a great photo, special places to get a great coffee, that sort of thing. So you get that added zing by having someone take you around as well. Best of both worlds. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. That's the last of the questions that came in. Thank and you. Thanks again for spending your time this afternoon with us and taking us through ultimate wine experiences i'm sure we'll i'm definitely craving to come back and try sipping all the beautiful wines in each of the vineyards yes. and i hope i hope our partners are as well yes uh, thanks so much once again my Kate. pleasure that's my pleasure happy friday everyone yeah, you too and with that i'd now like to introduce you to uh, our next collective uh, probably uh, one of the big ones in our collectives that is the great golf courses of australia and that is uh, Executive Officer Elizabeth Sattler, uh, commonly, uh, commonly called, known as Biz. And Biz comes from a, comes from a family of, uh, of family who owns golf courses in, uh, in Tassie, I just learned before, uh, which is fantastic. And obviously she's an avid golfer herself. So no better person to uh, have, a, have, a, have, us a, have us address, uh, have us address by to speak about uh, what Australia can offer for in terms of golfing experiences, not only for you, but for your uh, clients as well. So with that, uh, Biz, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Samar. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I know that uh, golf is not something that everybody is across. So before we get started today, I just thought I'd ask a couple of questions just around how many people have had experience with golf and how many players. So um, without ado, we'll just get this first question of the poll started and perhaps you can just respond to it when you see those come up on your screen. Great. Um, I can't actually see. Ah, oh, there we go. See the results there. Seventy-three percent percent have never played golf before. So that is actually a good thing because I've designed the presentation today to talk about what makes golf such a unique game and why Australian golf is so appealing. So, next question is: How many of you have clients that play golf? Great, we'll just wait for those results to pop up. 74%, that's amazing. 74% of the agents who are online with us today have clients that play golf. And for our final question, how many people have clients that play golf but you yourself don't really have that much of an idea about golf? Right, 
and we'll just get the results up from that, 74%. So I think that means we're all in the right place to be doing a little bit of training on golf today. So without further ado, let's get started. And I am going to talk to you now about golf in Australia. Wonderful. I'll just make sure that this is moving. So Great Golf Courses of Australia is basically a marketing collective of the top golf experiences in Australia. So we have a lot of golf courses in Australia, over 1,500 golf courses, but we just work with the real premium products, just like the other signature experience collectives. And our aim is to increase visibility of Australian golf product and help trade tour operators like yourselves understand the Australian golf landscape and what product might be best for you and for your clients to play when they're down in Australia. So because there are lots and lots of golf courses in Australia, and as I mentioned, we don't work with all of them, but we do actually have three different tiers of golf courses. So we have 28 golf courses that we work with in the entire country, and we break them down into three different collectives. Now, the reason we do that is we really found that there were two key markets of people who were playing golf in Australia. The, the first market was those who were coming to Australia just to play golf. All they wanted to do was go on a golfing holiday. They would play golf every single day, which might seem crazy to some people, but other people love it. And their whole holiday was really planned around that golf itinerary. And then we were seeing another market. And that market was people that were coming with family or with friends, and they might be a very good golfer, and they wanted to try and escape for maybe one round of golf or maybe two rounds of golf during their entire trip. But they didn't want the golf to be the sole thing that they were focused on during their holiday because a lot of people within that group weren't golfers. So that way we had to include second, a second and a third tier of golf products that were more focused in tourism hotspots and were a little bit more easy to access and a short lead for those people who were just looking to play golf um, on an ad hoc basis if they had a little bit of spare time. So the signature courses... They're a real five-star product, They're cream of the crop. They are exceptional standard, very high uh, uh, quality in design, often designed by famous uh, golf architects. And eight of these are actually rated in the top 100 golf courses in the world, which is pretty amazing. The premier courses, these are still really great golf courses. However, they offer a, a more accessible uh, option for golfers and they are located more in tourism hotspots. So, for example, they might be located around the Gold Coast or they might be located around the Margaret River region in Perth. So not quite as expensive, not quite as premium, but much easier to access and better for those people who are just looking for, you know, a one-off addition to that trip. And then unique golf courses. Now, these are things that are very much quintessentially Australian golf experiences. You wouldn't be able to do these anywhere else in the world. And while these golf courses are probably not reasons for people to come to Australia specifically, they're very interesting concepts and they're, they're really fun, uh, informative information that you can, you can add into your itineraries or talk to clients about when you're talking about golf in Australia. So as you can see here, we have a list of current members and you will see that there is golf courses basically in every state of the country, except we're not in the Northern Territory and that's just because it's very dry and a lot of desert. And as you probably know, golf courses tend to be very green and need a lot of water. So no golf courses that we work with in the Northern Territory. We do, as you can see here, have a lot of golf courses in this region here, which is right around Melbourne. So that's about 20, 25 minutes drive from Melbourne CBD which is great for people who may have uh, partners that don't play golf and they want to do something else during that four or five hours when the, the partners are playing golf. They can explore Melbourne or go shopping, you know, go on a laneway tour. And these golf courses around here are called the Melbourne Sandbelt, and that's a very, very famous area uh, in Melbourne. Oh, it's a little bit slow to load there. And as you can see here, 
we have some golf courses that are located right on the coast. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these in a moment, but these course, golf courses are called Lynx golf courses. It's a very particular type of golf course, and all these golf courses are actually located in Tasmania. So what's very interesting about a Lynx golf course is they were the golf courses that were originally uh, the first golf courses ever made. So they came from Scotland and Ireland. And you can see here that they're located right along the coast and on the, the really sandy undulating uh, dunes here. They've got short spiky grass and you'll see there's not really many trees. And the reason for that is these golf courses were always carved from this naturally sandy land that linked, hence the name links golf course, the beach, to the farmland. So it was land that was no good for farming, but it was really good for, for, uh, for golf courses because the sandy soils, very good drainage, which means you can play golf on them all year round. So golf in Australia. What makes golf in Australia so, so good and what differentiates us from other areas where you might go to play golf? This is a question I get asked a lot. In fact, people that don't play golf can sometimes not even you know, astounded that people might travel just to play golf. So the reason why golf, uh, our main competitors in this space are Scotland, as I mentioned before, is the home of golf and is where golf was first invented. Ireland, which has amazing Lynx golf courses, and they're very well known for their sense of humour as well. And the Lynx golf courses are the ones we just spoke about in the previous slide. The US, so the US is the largest golf market in the world and it's home to 23.8 million golfers. So there's a lot of golf courses over there. New Zealand has some really great public access golf courses and then Southeast Asia, which I'm sure is a location that a lot of Indians go to to play golf. So the difference between Southeast Asian golf and Australian golf is Southeast Asia has a very high quality service offering and that's really in large part due to the low cost in labour. So cost of labour in Australia is, is very high comparatively. The difference is the quality in the golf courses in Australia is much, much higher. So as I mentioned before, we have eight golf courses that are in the top 100 in the world, just in the one country. Whereas the golf courses in Southeast Asia are, are a different type of golf course. They have a different type of grass tends to be very, very hot and very, very humid. So it's actually quite hard to play golf. So they will usually have caddies and carts. In Australia, we don't have as many caddies and we don't have as many carts. Most of the golf courses are just for walking only. But the, the thing is, we don't have the humidity, we don't have the heat, and the golf courses are just a different type of golfing experience. One that's very, very premium and much closer to the Scotland, Ireland, US type of golf experience. So, oh, whoopsie, we've gone one too far there. So what makes golf in Australia so special? Well, as I mentioned, and we've actually given you an accidental preview to the slide, we aren't the home of golf, that is Scotland. However, we are home to nine or eight to nine courses in the World Top 100. It's actually nine golf courses and I've listed them here but I do have an asterisk here next to Elliston. So Elliston is a private golf course that's owned by James Packer, who is a very famous uh, media and hospitality family. The Packers are in Australia. They own Crown Casinos, which you may have heard of, and that golf course is not actually able to be accessed by anybody other than their family. So they, it is in the top 100, but we cannot get onto it. We don't have the oldest golf courses in the world. And again, that goes to Scotland, but we do have some of the most unique, including the longest golf course in the world, which is the Nullarbor Lynx. <clears throat> and this actually runs for 1,365 kilometers through central Australia. And don't worry, you don't have to walk between holes, but basically what you do is you play a hole and then you get in the car and you drive uh, on your way along the Nullarbor Links, which is a wonderful self-drive tour, and you can stop and play golf holes along the way. So it gives you something to break up that journey. On our website as well, we also talk about golf inspiration by interest, because one of the things that's really great about Australian golf is we do have a lot of diversity in our golf experiences. So what we do here is 
look at some of the different categories and we've broken down the golf experiences into different categories within our website and you can jump on and have a look at that there is a a link or a, um, a URL at the end of the presentation that I'll get, give to you. And as you can see here, we have World Top 100 courses, Coastal and Lynx Golf, Metropolitan Golf Courses, so golf courses that are located ne near major cities, Dr. Alistair McKenzie Design, who's a very famous golf course architect, Championship Courses, golf courses where you can see wildlife and golf courses where you are very close to world-class wineries. We don't have golf court carts in Australia. So this is a really important um, a piece of information. Not all the golf courses in Australia will allow you to have a golf cart. And by golf cart, I mean the driving golf carts, the electric ones, not the pool carts that you pull behind you with your golf bag on it. So the reason for that is we play golf in Australia very much like the traditional way in Scotland and Ireland. And the golf courses here are, as you can see, very undulating and quite hilly. And it is really quite uh, dangerous to have a golf cart on the golf course. And also it, because of the type of grass that they use, it can tear up the golf course. So if your client is unable to physically walk the golf course because they have a disability, no problem. We can arrange a golf cart, but otherwise they're predominantly walking courses. And it's also really important to remember, as I mentioned earlier, that we don't have the heat and the humidity in a lot of our golf courses in Australia. So there isn't, it's not quite as tiring walking around the golf course as it would be in perhaps somewhere in Malaysia. And obviously we also have views that will take your breath away. That's a golf course down in Tasmania. Actually, that's one of the ones that my family own and that's called Barn Boogle. You can see a Lynx golf course right on the beach there. So some golf courses we can't even get you on every day of the week. Now, one of the great things about the Great Golf Courses Collective is that we are a group of public and private member golf clubs. So as you may know, private member golf clubs are traditionally for members only. So you have to be a member of that golf course to be able to play there. And in fact, many of the very top golf courses especially in Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide, are private member golf courses. However, because we're a partnership with the golf courses, we can actually get exclusive access to these golf courses for your clients. So if they were to ring the golf club directly and try and get access, they wouldn't be able to get on. However, we can help facilitate access for you. We're a little bit different to the other collectives in that we actually have a booking reservation system. So we can book golf tee times. We don't do anything outside the confines of the golf club, just the golf tee time booking. And we can help you make those golf tee time bookings. So it takes a lot of pressure off you. We can help you with any information. We can ask questions that you need to go back to your clients with. So that really makes you look like you know a lot, lot about the product and really, really um, educated on the type of experiences that we have. And then we'll help you with everything through the booking process. So what we do do, is provide help with itinerary planning. We can help with course information. We have net rates for you that we will provide. Um, as I mentioned, we have the golf booking and reservation system. So we don't do transfers or hotels. It's just the golf, but that's okay. And then we have imagery, video, marketing content, anything that you might need to help sell golf in Australia. So one, another important point about golf in Australia is we don't have golf caddies, not at every golf club. So for those people that aren't aware of what a caddy is, a caddy is almost like a little bit of your own private tour guide around the golf course. The reason they're there is to try and help the player play their best at the golf course. They have a lot of tips and insider knowledge about how to play particular holes and they'll give you advice on that. So the golf courses in Australia, a lot of them do have caddies available, but we do need to pre-book those. So you must make sure that when you're making an inquiry with us, that you uh, let us know if your client would like a caddy so that we can arrange that before they arrive. We do have friendly locals though. And as you can see, here's the lovely little kangaroo out on the golf course. And we have a lot of wildlife that you've seen every day on the golf courses all around the country. So that's really exciting. In fact, I even played in New South Wales on New South Wales golf course once, and we saw humpback whales swimming past. It was incredible. So a lot of amazing wildlife in, around the golf courses in Australia. So as I mentioned, the tea time reservations, we can provide you with a net rate, 
all reservations can go through our tea time reservation manager who will help with all the details that you need. And then we also can provide recommendations for DMCs if you are looking for a, an operator on the ground here to provide you with hotel recommendations, transfer recommendations, etc. A couple of things just to remember when we're talking about making tea times. It is important at some of those private member golf clubs to have a letter of introduction. So a letter of introduction is basically a letter from a, a golfer's home club that would ask them, uh, would say to them, this uh, golfer, her name is Elizabeth, her handicap is 17 and she is a member at uh, Royal Melbourne Golf Club and we would like to introduce her to your golf course. It's just an etiquette thing. It's quite traditional and it, it, it does give a real sense of exclusivity in terms of being able to access the course. Not all the golf courses will require one of those. So it just depends on where your uh, client is looking to play. Golf course etiquette is fairly standard across the world. We do have a sheet with information on etiquette. And for those that don't play golf, some of the etiquette around golf does seem a bit old and mundane. However, it's really important to remember a lot of these rules are actually in place to protect uh, the golfer. There are people out on golf courses hitting little white balls with clubs and they can go anywhere. So a lot of them is, are around the safety of the golfer and also ensuring the golf course is left in a condition that the people that are playing in the groups behind them enjoy it at the same quality as you do. Caddies we've touched on, cuts we've touched on. And as I just mentioned previously, private golf club availability. It does depend on which club you're trying to book, but some of the golf clubs, especially the very famous and very exclusive ones in Melbourne, um, only have a number of days of the week that you can access the golf club. And that is because their members play on other days. So just important to raise that with us and keep that in mind when you are looking to book itineraries we do have information sheets with the days of the week that certain golf clubs are available so we can provide you with that so you can help plan your itinerary accordingly. Another great little project we've been working on during the whole coronavirus disaster that's been happening around the world is actually our golf masterclasses. So what we have done is created a series of golf training and education sessions. They are all available on Vimeo. And basically in each session, we look at a particular element of golf. So we start with the basics of golf, a history of the game, and then we go through different types of golf courses, different the way that you score in golf. And then we look more into golf architects and specifics around different regions of golf in Australia. So if you're looking for more information and to further enhance your knowledge on golf just generally, it's a really great place to start. And as I mentioned there, that is our URL and my contact details are here. So if you have any questions, I'll obviously have a chance to answer them now. But if you would like to pop me an email with any information, request for any information, just please do so. So on that note, do we have any questions? Thank you, Biz. That was fantastic. I mean, just the, the locations of some of those golf courses are just spectacular. You know, at least at least coming from uh, where I live in Mumbai, uh, to have that kind of a setting is just unbelievable. And I've I haven't been to too many golf courses in Australia, but the one that I've been to uh, twice, if I can remember correctly, is the Peppers Muna Links on the on the Mohenjan Peninsula. And I just kept blown away with the location because you got the peninsula on one side, you've got this beautiful golf course, and you've got amazing amazing accommodation and food and buying and beverage going on. A complete, complete package that you can you know, sort of avail. So even if you're not playing golf, you can still enjoy uh, uh, some sort of a quasi golfing experience uh, by some other activity. In fact, I was there on one occasion where it was uh, a team building activity that was organized by a business events planner on the golf course. So we arrived by helicopter, we landed on one of the holes, and then we had an area uh, allocated for us where we did it with uh, we did team building activities with golf carts and the golf balls and stuff like that. So it was a lot of fun. So we learned a lot about, we learned a little bit about golf, but we also, you know, rode the cat, rode the carts and everything. So an interactive experience there. Uh, so thanks for that. So yeah, there, there we have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll take the first one. And this one is, 
uh, if we do require to uh, hire caddies, what would be the approximate uh, rates for them? It depends possible. on the golf course, but normally between about 70 and 90 Australian dollars. And that's, that's for the uh, full day or is that on an hourly basis? That's for the full 18 holes, yeah. Full 18 holes, okay, full 18 great. Holes. Thank you. I've just got another question. Uh, in case we organize a golf tour for our clients, how many nights should we consider minimum? Oh, I mean, it depends on where, where you're looking to go. I would say five nights is really good, particularly if you're looking to maybe do Sydney and Melbourne or even just Melbourne. Um, but if you're looking to do the top, say if you're looking to do the courses that are all in the world top 100, I would say probably seven to 10 days would be great. Okay, so and, and a mix of uh, different golf courses, different golf courses, of course, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question. And the uh, great thing about golf is it, it only takes five, five hours, five and a half hours. So if you are going to these destinations, you can play golf for half the day, but you also have the opportunity to go and do other things in the afternoon or, you know, if you wanted to go and see a show of an evening, you can do that. You're not and a lot of them are located very close to major cities. So you can actually spend your nights in the city and go and do things around the city in, uh, on the times that you're not playing golf. So it, it's a really great thing to include in an itinerary that isn't going to take you away and lock out four or five days of your entire trip because you have to travel and you're based very remotely. So in that respect, it's really great. Fantastic. I've just got another question. Uh, and this question is, if we would like to have a friendly uh, golf game between uh, Indian and Australian players, uh, would it be possible to organize and uh, through you? Yes, potentially. It would just, again, depend on how many people that we were looking at, where they wanted to play, and what kind of tournament that we were looking at doing. Great. There are the three more questions uh, that have just come in, so I'm just going to take them off one by one. Um, uh, you touched upon the letter of introductions uh, in, in one slide, but could you please elaborate a little bit more on that for the benefit of uh, our partners on, on why exactly would that be needed and again, how much time in advance would you need to prepare all those documentation? Absolutely. So normally the golf clubs that you will need a letter of introduction for would have to be booked probably three or four months in advance. So they will need to be advanced bookings. And the, I guess the letter of introduction works a little bit like a recommendation from your golf club to their golf club so that the members know that you are a good golfer, that you're going to come and be respectful to the property of their, their property because they all pay membership fees to be at this golf course and also going to leave the golf course in a great condition. So just like if you were had people who were guests coming to play at your golf club in India, you would hope that they would be respectful and that they would you know, right. do the right thing at your golf club. So it's quite a traditional thing, um, but I actually had an operator from New Zealand who was telling me yesterday that he, a lot of his clients actually really like it because it makes them feel very exclusive and give them great bragging rights. They have to go to their golf club and say, oh, I'm going on a trip to Australia, which starts a conversation about it. So they get really excited about it. So. It can be a little bit time consuming from the tour operator's end. However, from the client's end, it, it tends to be something that makes them quite excited. Now, don't worry about the letters of introduction because we have templates that we can provide you with. So we'll give you a template if you are looking at playing one of those golf courses. All you need to do is ask us about that. So we'll make it very easy for you. It's just making sure they're signed off. Fantastic. I think that that would pop perhaps make the process much easier to be handled. Uh, the next one is, uh, in, in your opinion, what would you say is, is the best time of year to play golf in Australia? And there's a part two to that. Um, I mean, is, is, is golf a seasonal sport or can you play it all year round? And I guess the third part of that one is, uh, what time of the day would you normally recommend? Uh, assuming that, you know, an Indian Indian holiday maker uh, is traveling for, uh, for say 10 to, uh, 10 to 15 days mm -hmm. and he has maybe he or she maybe has just one or one or day for golf uh, then what time of the day you, you think is uh, they should allocate to a golf activity yeah so you can play golf in Australia all year round uh, we have golf courses 
basically all around the country that are open all year round. Queensland might be the only one that would be affected a little bit by the rain season. Otherwise, no problem. Even in Tasmania where it's cold, where it's just where I am now, so that's why you can see the woolly coat that I've got on. <laughs> um, but you can actually play here all year round, so it, it doesn't matter. It is a bit chilly during uh, during the day, but it's not a big deal to, uh, to go and play. It just means you might need to wear an extra jumper. Time of day, I usually recommend playing first thing in the morning if you can, because then, especially if you've got people that in your party that don't play golf, you can go and join them at lunchtime or after lunch and go and do another activity. So in the morning tends to be a good one. Remember to allocate between five and six hours for a round of golf not including traveling to and from the course. By the time they get there, they play their golf, they might have a drink afterwards and something to eat, so to earn a shower, so yeah. And I guess the last one that, uh, that we have is, uh, you know, uh, for those avid golf, golf fans and golf followers, uh, just like in cricket, they want to have an opportunity to interact with a famous Australian golfer, you know, who's been, at, uh, who's been, who's been very, um, uh, very popular at the world golfing stage and maybe won some masters tournaments and stuff like that. So I think uh, the, uh, the question is, would it be possible to organize a session of golf uh, or maybe a round of golf or maybe not even a lesson, just a master class with one of these guys, let's say a Greg Norman. And is that is that something that's possible to do? Or is that something that you have in the plans? Obviously, there's a, a fairly large cost involved depending on who they are. And the one thing that that comes down to is when these guys, these pros like Adam Scott or Jeff Ogilvy or Greg Norman are playing golf, they're usually playing in the US. So they're not always in Australia. So even though they're Australian, they're not always here, just like the cricketers constantly traveling. So yeah. it's something that we obviously would have to arrange around that schedule. Having said that, you never believe that uh, we had a familiar that came to Australia and we had an Indian tour, Indian tour operator who was on that familiar and they were playing golf in Sydney and he hit his ball and he went up to get it because it was had gone a little bit sideways and he saw the party behind them and Steve Wall was playing in the um in the <laughs> room behind them. So he had a photo of Steve Wall. He was very excited about it. <laughs> he got two in one, yeah. He got two Steve Wall the yeah. guy, and he got Steve Wall the golfer. Exactly. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Biz. Uh, fantastic. Um, experience. Um, I'm sure that a lot of our partners here would be talking about it to the, the clients in the near future for, 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 for travel potentially. Uh, but thanks again, once, uh, thanks once again for spending your afternoon with us. That was really insightful. I'm sure our partners have learned a little bit more about Australia and golf and what, and what the whole proposition is about. Uh, we have no more questions, so thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, evening. And with that, I'll have a lovely weekend and thank you for having me. Thank you. I'll hand over back to Ritu. Thank you so much, Samar. Thank you, Biz. Thank you, Kate. And it was an extremely engaging session for sure. Um, I definitely have to confess that I fall into the 33% category of people who've, ne who've not played golf. Uh, but yes, a couple of times when I've had the opportunity to hold that golf club and uh, the locations that Australia has to offer when it comes to these courses are completely, they can completely encompass you over there. And uh, the game has all the potential to like completely grip you in. The first time that I had the golf course in my hand, I actually thought that, okay, I can actually go back and learn a little more about the sport. But unfortunately, I never got that opportunity. But uh, Biz, that was extremely engaging. So thank you so much. Uh, like every time, uh, my participants and my audience, thank you so much for being with us all throughout the week and attending these sessions. Uh, this record, this rec is a recording again, like all the other sessions, and we shall be sending this out to you. A lot of you have asked us for the presentation and have asked us for the videos. Please be rest assured, we'll definitely send this across to you on Monday. And uh, we will also be sending out uh, a survey along with this uh, thing. We really, really want all the participants to take five minutes out of your busy schedule and answer that survey. It only helps us uh, become better and serve you better. We'd like to understand what is it that we have to bring next for your offering. And um, that's about it. So thank you so much. You guys have a lovely weekend. 
it's uh, great to have you guys along here and uh, we look forward to meeting you soon thank you everybody and have a lovely enjoyable weekend bye bye